the American church's number one problem is it's got man's hands all over it instead of God's. It is all about pleasing man. It's all about exalting man. It's all about making uh, man like his own God. And that's not what the Holy Spirit's trying to do. So in many ways, we literally are in this country as churches in this country. We are, we are sort of in the position that we're opposing God instead of being for God. So America's got to wake up and realize, ready? Here's the rest of it. You cannot control God. You cannot control God. I, I listen to certain preachers every now and then just to keep the reality, and I can't believe how many preachers, and they got some huge churches. I can't believe how many preachers, their, their whole basic message is, is that God is so bound to his promises that you can pretty much control him when you start telling him what his word says. Does that really sound like God? You don't have to tell him to keep his promises. You just have to believe his promises. You don't need to manipulate him. You just need to believe and obey him. I got to keep going. Sorry. We can't rewrite truth. We can't rewrite truth. You know what the world wants us to do? They want us to become relevant. They want us to make the truth we preach relevant. Well, I got good news for you. If it's truth, it's relevant. It's eternal. It never changes. Uh, you can't tell the Holy Spirit when and how much he can move. That's the next one. <clears throat> oh, man. I could really go with this one, but I, I can't. But you know what? You can't tell the Holy Spirit you can do this much, but you can't do this much. You, you can have so much amount of freedom, but you can only have that amount of freedom. You can't. You can't. You can't. <clears throat> and the last one, you can't take the body of Christ where the head doesn't want to go. And when we try to take the church to be a, a, a cultural community center as opposed to being the body of Christ, you're trying to take it where, where God's not wanting it to go. <clears throat> He's not wanting it to be the community center. He's wanting it to be the light to keep the ships off of the rocks. If it's of man, it's going to fail. And so I have to believe inside of me that if, if one plus one equals two, then the reason why the churches in America are struggling so much is because it's got too much of man and not enough of God in it. <clears throat> you know what was refreshing to me about the Asbury revival? A, it was Methodist. <laughs> B, it was so unpretentious. They literally, they, they just came together. They had a contrite heart. They, they just humbled themselves. They didn't put any restrictions. They didn't have any expectations. They just sought God, and he showed up. Amen. What a great idea. <clears throat> anyway, what Gamil, Gamaliel was trying to tell them was, but if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow it, okay? So if it is a man, it's going to fail. But if it's of God, you can't overthrow it. It's unstoppable. If something is orchestrated by God, it's going to accomplish his purpose. Now, in your folly, you can set yourself up against it, but that's silly. It's not going to work out, and that's the reason why America's church need to turn this around right now. Uh, I've been saying this for the last eight years that I've been here. I'm going to continue to say as long as I'm here, our job is not to seek God's blessings on what we are doing and what we want to do. Our job is to seek what God is blessing, what is his will, and to put ourselves in that. We're not trying to bring God over here. We're trying to go to what God is doing. <clears throat> you know what? You remember what the stat I gave you about Africa and how it's been growing and growing and growing? Here's something I want you to get inside your mind. 
during the same span of time that Christianity in Africa grew by a hundred million, okay, pretty impressive, right? Four million were killed for Christ. Because you see, when you stand with God, you don't stand in favorable <laughs> view of an ungodly world. You, when you draw that line in the sand and identify with him, clearly with him, you don't have everybody's excitement. <clears throat> but here's the best thing Camillo said. He told him this, he said, you might be found opposing God. You might even be found opposing God. In other words, if God is in this and you stand against it, you're just putting yourself in opposition to God. I'm going to talk to you. I know I'm in Acts, but I, I got to talk to you about one of my favorite stories in the Bible. And so I'm going to ask you to go there in just a moment. But I'm going to talk to you. It's in, it's in Joshua chapter 5. But Israel has passed over the Jordan. They have circumcised their army. They have celebrated the Passover, and they are now ready to take the promised land. Joshua, no doubt, as the leader of this army, and now the replacement of Moses is, is like, okay, God, this is a great big under, this great big task and undergoing that you have given me. And I, and so he's, he's out for a walk, and the Bible says that he runs into a guy who's got a sword already pulled out. So look at it. It says Joshua 5, 13, 15. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing there before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said, are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, no, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now have I come. Can I please reword that for simplicity, okay? Um, Joshua looks at him, he says, are you for us or our enemies? Whose side are you on? And, and the Lord's response was, neither I am here to command the army of God. I'm not here to be on your side or your side. I'm here to lead. Are you on my side? I'm trying to drive something home that is really, really, really important, I believe, for the church in America to get back on track. God doesn't get on our side. We get on his side. Um, I know we like, you know, if God is for us, right? If God is for us, that if is important in that, that verse there. Because the bottom line is, is if you are with him, he's on your side. If you are in him and you are about his will, he is for you. I don't know where I heard this. Maybe I even thought it up myself. But God doesn't take sides. He takes teammates. All right, so let's go back. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? Now, it's interesting here in the ESV, which is usually what I've been using as I'm going through Acts, it doesn't have the Lord's name in capitalized. But the term there is my Lord, Adonai, all right, which should be and is in a lot of the other ones. So, so I want you to get this. He, he is talking to the Lord. Sometimes when it talks about the angel of the Lord and all that kind of stuff, it gets a little confused. He's talking to the Lord. He says, and the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take off your sandals from your feet for the place you're standing is holy. And Joshua did so. He's in the presence of the Lord. I know so because he's worshiping him and because he is told he is on holy ground, okay? And angels don't make ground holy. God does. And also, because, it, and I'm not going to read it, if you start with the next chapter, the Lord speaks to him first person and gives him the instructions of how you're going to take Jericho, all right? So here he is. He is talking to the Lord. Now, I share this with you 
Because I want you to, I, I really want you to get this. And this is the next thing that's in your notes. God is for his will above everything. Think for just a moment. God is for his will. What's he going to do? His will. As a church, do we want to be successful? Yeah. How do you, what, what's the recipe for success in the church? God's will. Because he's going to do his will. I want my church to grow. Well, you know, if I do this and do this, I'll be, our church will be seen differently in the community and people will come. Guess what? There's a lot of churches that have a lot of people, but they don't preach the will of God. And I'm not bashing as a little church complaining about big churches. No. But you can collect a lot of people if you tell them what they want to hear. But the bottom line is, is God is for his will. And his will is come out from among the sin and be holy. Because without holiness, nobody's going to see God. So I can tell you everything you want to hear, and I can stroke you and make you feel good. But if you're not holy in the Lord, you're not going to go to heaven. And all I'm doing is being a dece deceiver. <clears throat> God is for his will above everything. He doesn't change his will for me. We're supposed to pray what? Thy will be done. He doesn't change his will for me. Well, Lord, I don't like that. I want you to do this. Okay, God says, never. No, he's going to do his will. He doesn't change his will for me. He doesn't answer my request if they are not his will. I'm telling you, I can't handle much more of the preaching where you where where literally you you tell God what you want. I don't want to say amen, I want to say stupid. That's just stupid. You don't tell God what you want. He doesn't answer my request if it's not his will. He doesn't bless what I'm doing unless I'm doing what he wants done. Guys, right there. He doesn't bless what we're doing. He blesses his will. When you do his will, his blessings abide. He doesn't follow my lead. <laughs> he leads and I follow. He never went to his apostles or calling his disciples and said, you lead and I'll follow you. No, he said, come and follow me. I know where I'm going. I know what the Father has sent me here to do. I know the Father's will. Come and follow me. We have propagated a mentality. <laughs> <clears throat> That spouse, come on, now listen closely before you judge me. God is for me. God wants to bless me. God has abundance for me. Now, if that sounds like I'm off, listen, God is for God. Heaven and earth will pass away. Guess where you are? on earth. <laughs> Heaven and earth will pass away, but his word is forever. His word, his will is forever. God is for us when we on his side. God wants to bless me. <laughs> in accordance to my obedience to do his will. Amen. Amen. Oh, I believe in blessings. They're just linked with obedience. <clears throat> and God's plan for my abundance, well, the good news, or the bad news is, 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 is his idea of abundance is not always the same as your and my idea of abundance. 
You see, when we think abundance, we think some earthly. When God's thinking abundance, he's thinking about that which no man can take away, that cannot perish. He's thinking about spiritual abundance. I, I, listen, it's nice to have things, but an abundance of the Spirit of God in our lives, moving around, moving in our church, oh, that's far better. It really is. I want the abundance of the Spirit of God more than the abundance of stuff. <clears throat> How many of you remember the old bumper sticker, God is my co-pilot? No, he's not. No, 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 he's not. Listen, <laughs> he is the commander in chief of the army. He is the head of the body, which is the church. He is, he is the one that's in control. And you are either part of his army or part of his body, or you are on, you're, you're doing your own thing. And you won't see the blessings of God. And that doesn't mean you won't see blessings because Satan will bless your socks off to keep you going in the wrong direction, to keep you deluded. When the church condones sin and it waters down righteousness, it's doing its own thing. It's not going to be blessed eternally, even if it looks blessed earthly. God never compromises to accomplish his will. God's will never compromises. Never, 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 never does God compromise his will. So where are the blessings? In his will. Where's the favor of God? In his will. Where's the church going to be healthy and seeing the power of God move and the miraculous happen and the loss coming into the knowledge of Jesus Christ? In his will. I love the believers of the first church. <laughs> they knew what God had told them to do. They knew without a shadow of a doubt what they had seen Jesus what they had heard Jesus, what they knew Jesus wanted them to do. I love it, folks. Listen, the Sanhedrin, they, they, they pull them over here and they say, you are not to preach in Jesus' name. Now stop it. And they looked at the Sanhedrin and said, we can't. We can't. It cannot happen that we are not going to talk about Jesus. <clears throat> now you got the whole the high priest and all of them gathered together and, and they pulled them in there and they're saying, you can't keep filling Jerusalem up with this whole concept that there is salvation in Jesus Christ. You can't keep doing that. And I just looked at him and said, you know what? We got to. We got it. Folks, that's where the Lord is trying to open the eyes of the church of America. We can't not talk about what we know to be true. We can't. And when it comes to who is the hope of the world and the hope of eternal life, we got to keep talking about it because it's the only hope there is because there is no other hope <laughs> except christ jesus lord help us find the same courage they had look how the passage ends i'm going to read the last part of it again it says when they had called in the apostles they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of jesus and let them go then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they had that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name and every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. <laughs> Gotta love it, folks. It's the reason why we're spending all this time in Acts. <laughs> you gotta love it. History is repeating itself. Here they are. They were told, you know what? Don't do it. They beat them. 
They took their beating, and what did they do? They went right back to preaching and teaching about Jesus. They did not let up. You see, they did not get their cues from their culture. They got their instructions from Jesus. They got the guidance of the will of God through the Holy Spirit, and they followed it. They followed it. <clears throat> they were beaten. I think sometimes we slide over that part without thinking about the implications. Folks, listen. You will not always be the life of the party when you are the person sharing Jesus. I remember two buddies of mine in high school. I'll never forget one of them when he looked at me and he said these words right here. He said, he said, have you heard about my party on Saturday night? And I said, no. He said, good. He said, I, I, he said, I, I purposely am not inviting you. See, we were buddies. But he said, he said, I know where you stand. <laughs> and he said, it's going to be a, he said, my parents are gone. He said, it's going to be quite a party. And I know you probably wouldn't want to be there. And I said to him, thanks for not inviting me. Folks, I don't want to be the life of the party. I want to be that voice in the wilderness saying, make straight the path of the Lord. This is the way. Walk in it. You got to understand that when you choose to follow the will of God, you will not be the, the, the person that, that everybody is just so wild to be around. <clears throat> so we need, to do, we need to understand something. There is a cost to pay when you obey. There is a cost. Um, they never wavered. And I think that's a word that needs to, we, we need to get, we, we've got to quit wavering. We've got to quit wavering. And so here's my question to you. When opposition comes, will opposition make you dig in and hold the line? Or will it make you want to quit? Make you want to blend in? That's the reason why this study is important. God has marvelous things in store for those that he is leading. Marvelous things. Everybody look at me. He has marvelous things, blessings untold, power and honor you cannot even imagine for you if you will follow his lead. If you will, if you will make up your mind, I am here to serve the Lord and to do his will. He's got good stuff, better stuff than you could ever imagine. <clears throat> I love what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 16, and it's not up there, but basically it's this. In verse 9, he said, a great door for an effective work has opened, has opened before me. A great door has opened but there are many who oppose it. You know how you know you're going in the right direction with Jesus? There's opposition. When you're doing what you need to be doing, there's opposition. Satan doesn't like it. And those that are in his camp will stand against you. <clears throat> Always focus on the door that God has opened and not those that oppose you. And I've got to say this, I've got to say this before. Listen, a great opportunity is before us, but here's what I want you to get. Please hear this as a last statement. Please get this. We've got to start speaking to people the truth and the words of life. Don't think preaching and teaching. Think just speaking about Jesus. You hearing me? Don't, don't think I got I to gotta set them straight. I got, I got to preach and teach and all that. No, you just need to speak about Jesus. And you know when? Every, every day, every time you can. That's what they did. They said, don't do it. And they said, we got to. And after getting beat, they went right back out there and was doing what? The very thing they were doing before they got in trouble. And that was just speaking about Jesus and telling everybody, 
Listen, that's what we've got to do. We've got to be speaking about the hope and the truth that there is in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. So we need to take the, the thought that Joshua conveyed in chapter 5 there. What does my Lord say to his servant? That's the, that's the word I give you as you walk out of here. What are you saying to me, Lord? What is it you're wanting me to do? Because that's what your blessings and your honor come when I'm doing what you've told me to do.